So why did I choose this picture for the presentation? Because that's what old code does. It blows up in your face when you least expect it. So my name is Anna Felina. I'm a developer, a problem solver. I'm a teacher, advisor. Uh, I own a company called Fullab, and I organize a conference in Montreal. It's called Confu. So let's imagine you inherited a 10-year-old code base, or sometimes 12, or sometimes 15. All right, so welcome to the big leagues. You have a 15-year-old code base. So, and you came to this talk, so I really admire your bravery because to deal with 15-year-old code, it takes some stomach. So what, what was the web like 15 years ago, just to situate you? Because we like to hate on this old code and the old practices that are really bad, but we have to understand when it was written and what, what, what web development was all about. So 15 years ago, it was 2000, so obviously it was the Y2K bug, that's when, uh, well, you probably know, but that's when people realized that two digits for storing year is no longer adequate because now with 2000, you need two more digits, so either the database doesn't support two more digits or the sorting is all wrong, um, a bunch of problems. So um, Google launched AdWords. So Google was already, already existed and it launched AdWords before that. I don't know how they were making any money. And then there was no Twitter, then there was no Facebook, there was no iTunes. MySpace was really cool. Um, I'm sorry? AOL. Yes, the AOL, yeah, the CDs that we got in the mail. Yeah. It was the thing. It was around 2000. And today we try to, you know, we laugh at Internet Explorer 6, but it didn't even exist yet. It was still Internet Explorer 5. And I remember uh, right before that, I was using Netscape. And who, who uses Netscape Navigator anymore? It had this gray background by default, so all websites were like, a, uh, I think it was hex CCC. Um, it was this light gray background on all pages. Um, ICQ was only starting to be cool. So before that was MSN, and then, wow, ICQ, and it was, it was the thing. Some people still remember their ICQ number to this day. And, you know, the CSS, you know, right, 2000. So if you were able to achieve rounded corners, you were really cool. And back in the day, to do rounded corners, you had probably to do a table, because right, no divs and stuff, so plain old tables, you know, you remove the borders, and then you... You put three by three grid, and then you put little corners here and there, and then the content in the middle, and if you wanted some nested corners, um, and then you would have to put another table in that cell anyway. So uh, shadows, yeah, shadows were, I didn't even try to do shadows back then. <laughs> it was just, it, it seemed like rocket science. So yeah, this is what it was like. And here's Yahoo, so I mean, it still looks pretty lean today, but there was no Yahoo News. It was just a directory. Um, and then you had Yahoo Mail. I still have my Yahoo account from that day. Uh, and then this, this was 600 pixels wide. 600 pixels wide. Just let that sink in for a moment. That was the standard that people used. So they didn't expect the screens to be too big. So maybe they expected the screen to be Maybe 800 pixels wide, maybe. So they made the site 600 pixels wide. I measured, yeah. So your code was written around that time. The code that you just inherited was written in that era. So don't expect it to be awesome like today. I mean, computer science has already had all the concepts, but it didn't quite apply to web development because it was new. Those people were new and they didn't quite know what they were doing. So my objectives with this presentation is to give you a whole lot of advice, share some stories, and show you how I solve some of the challenges with the old code so that you can avoid the mistakes that I made. You can reduce mistakes in your um, decisions. You can increase the development speed. You can uh, reduce the technical debt, um, avoid getting stuck, because often with legacy what happens is that things just don't mix together and you end up being stuck because of you know version mismatch and the, the new version uh, disabled some feature and the old code doesn't support it so we cannot 
upgrade the version so that we can use the shiny new features in other areas of the code. And I also want to increase your confidence because with those stories, you know, seeing how other people struggle with it and how they solve the problems, maybe it will help you increase your own confidence when dealing with legacy because they're not really that hard problems. It's just that you need to take the time and approach them correctly. So let's have some fun before we dive into the hardest stuff. You all know code smells. So this is just an example of table names that I've seen. So let's say you have users, but in the same database, you might have a table called customer. See, so one is plural and the other one is singular. So you have that mix. So you can never quite remember which one it is. And sometimes you have uh, two parts to the name and one is plural and the other is singular and sometimes it's reverse. So you can never quite remember. You always have to look it up. Um, sometimes you use an underscore, sometimes you don't. So use a profile in one word. Sometimes you get serveur, which is in French means server. But you don't know that it's in French, right? You just read it and you know, if, you're, if you also speak French, you can guess, okay, this is, this is French. But you know, there's no hint anywhere that this is French, especially when you start mixing French and English because network doesn't exist in French. We say réseau. So now you start mixing languages. And sometimes there are words in one language that mean one thing, but in another it means something else. But you don't know which language it is. So the context is lost. So I see this a lot and it's, yeah, it's quite un unpleasant to deal with those databases. It's not the hardest part, but you know, it, it's annoying. Okay. Yeah, German and French and English and, and Russian. Russian. Russian, yes. <laughs> I, 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 I speak Russian, but I wouldn't even know the technical terms in Russian. That could be funny. Oh, uh, so some of the some of the table names are written in Cyrillic. So this is great. Like you don't even have that on your keyboard. You don't even you wouldn't know where to find them. You press. Copy paste, yeah. All you can do is copy paste and hope for the best. Um, sometimes you have things that give you a false sense of security. So when you read this line, you can certainly understand that, you know, I don't know if you all work with PHP, but uh, HTML entities takes the inputs and converts the entities to like the ampersand and stuff. So it basically strips the tags. But I've seen people use that in order to secure or filter the input to avoid um, um, XSS attacks, cross-site scripting attacks. Um, so they do that, but it doesn't protect you from certain things because not everything is an HTML character. So you could still have an SQL injection with this. It doesn't protect you. But the word clean is misleading, so they use the word clean, and maybe it's like in an included file, 10, 10 levels down, so you don't know where it's actually happening. And then you see, oh, clean, you know, dollar clean. So you, you assume that the content of this, of this variable is clean, but maybe it's not. And so you assume things, and you work with the code, and then you start dig digging deeper, and like, whoa, whoa, this is totally unsecure. What is happening? And of course, you're going to concatenate the SQL query, forget prepared statements, and just shove it in a, in a query. Um, yeah, so I see a lot of includes, uh, a file that includes five files on top, and then those files include other files. But I say include, but usually it's a require once, because at some point the developer loses, doesn't want to include the same file twice, so they lose track of what they include, they might, have, might as well have just include everything instead. Uh, Auto-loading is overrated, you know? Uh, so they would just include a whole bunch of things, and especially functions. Like, and I remember that when I started working with PHP around 2001, maybe, um, it, that was very common. It was very common to uh, include a functions file which contained a bunch of functions. There's no concept of object-oriented programming. And it's very hard to automate tests like that because you don't have concepts of units. Yes, it's a function, but you know you just 
pull things, move things around. You cannot really set up the state correctly. Um, it's quite difficult to unit test that. It's not the hardest thing to unit test, but it makes things more difficult. And you know things like that, uh, where you you have an if and if order ID is greater than that, then use this SQL. So you just say SQL equals something, but otherwise SQL equals something else. And then you wonder what happened at that order. What happened? Something changed. Some some business logic changed. Something changed, but you don't know what because obviously it's not documented. So now you, when, whenever you try to debug things, you are in a lot of trouble because you're not you're not quite sure what's happening. And all of this, of course, all the SQL and the HTML and the PHP, it's all in one file most of the time. Yeah, and so whenever you find something like this, I call it a, a, a weakness that I usually bookmark for later because if something blows up somewhere, this will probably be the first thing I will investigate. This is a high risk statement. This is a high risk area that is, so if something blows up somewhere, there's a good chance that the answer lies in this, in this block. So you start refactoring, but you know, there are a lot of dangers. There are a lot of challenges, a lot of obstacles. One of the things is it can take too long. The customer wants a feature now, not necessarily a month from now or a year from now. They want something now. They don't, they don't think about refactoring. They just need to keep moving forward. They may have acquired the code base from another company, and so they, they started their, their new company with this code base. They started billing customers, started doing something with it. And then things break or their uh, business changes, and now they have to do things differently. They have to bill according to new rules. They need to add new, um, new plans, new, new, new ways of calculating things. Um, so for example, they expand to the country, and now they have to start charging tax. And if you've ever dealt with taxes, uh, I know that around the area of Los Angeles only, there's like 400 different tax codes. So it's almost like, you know, from this street to that street, it's that tax code, and here it's that. I don't know how they do it, but, you know, there's a whole bunch of zip codes in my database, and it associates to uh, a whole lot of uh, zip codes. But if you do that internationally, that's a lot of tax codes. <laughs> So it can take very long to refactor something like that, uh, refactor a code that is so fragile that you're, you're not sure if you can touch this line of code without provoking a chain reaction that will break everything. And because there are no tests, there, tests are your safety net, and you don't have a safety net. So you will cross on a, on a string between two mountains, and you, don't, you can always fall down, and there's nothing to catch you. So that's how you feel. It's, it's really, um, really intimidating sometimes. And it can take too long because you have to be very careful about every, everything you change in the code because it can have a big impact. So one of the things I notice also is whenever somebody attempts a full rewrite, it almost always fails. Sometimes due to the skill of the person, but often simply because full rewrites, at least in my experience, don't quite work. It has to be progressive, simply because the client keeps expecting those new changes, those improvements, new features. So the client has expectations, and you cannot rewrite on one side and then keep dealing with that fragile legacy at the same time, because you're trying to get away from it, so you're, you're, you get stuck. And so progressive rewrites are uh, a very good approach, and I will show you many ways in which it has been achieved in companies. So whenever you write new code, so new code that's like a, a new class, a new module, you're going to rewrite a, a chunk at a time. Uh, whenever you do that, um, that's new code, and it can run side by side with the existing application. So you just put a few classes here, and then call that instead of the old code, and then the old code you can remove. And there are tools that can sniff and say whether other parts of the code are referring to that code that you want to remove. Don't just remove because you assume it's no longer needed. Um, if you see a database column that you think you might no longer need, uh, really check. Um, it's, sometimes it's better not to remove just in case, 
And then once you are almost done with the rewrite, it will be very obvious because you can just run unit tests and you can see what's being executed and which code is dead and you just clean it out afterwards. It's like when you want to, uh, to clean something that's really, really messy, what you do is that you take everything out, you put the clean things on one side, the dirty things on the other, and then you can clean more easily than if you were to do this one by one. So um, sometimes it's uh, new code that is written in the same language. Uh, sometimes it's new code that's written in a completely different language. So for example, one of my uh, stories I will share is moving from ASP Classic to PHP, PHP 5. And ASP Classic hasn't been supported since, I believe, 2003. So it's, it has been discontinued a long time ago. And so they have to move from the language to a new language. So how do you run all of this side by side? And there are ways to do that. Um, one of the ways is to use things like mode rewrite, mode alias. Different languages are actually fairly easy to run side by side because um, sometimes you are limited to one version of the language per system. But if they're two different languages, they don't interfere with each other. Uh, with PHP, it's a lot more difficult to run two versions on the same machine. So yeah, you can have same or different programming language when you rewrite. Uh, some of the, I guess, more, more difficult things when you have those two applications, they already connect to the same database. All languages have connect um, methods that allow you to connect to databases, read files. That's kind of easy. So the only thing that remains is, you know, where is your session stored and how you can access that. And sometimes it's straightforward. It's in the database. That's great. It's in the file. That's also not too bad. Um, sometimes it's in some special area uh, because of that's how this language was used to handle it. And I'll show you some examples of that as well. Another difficulty is you can lose data, you can break stuff, and it's, it's an unsettling feeling that you have so much power, so much control at your disposal, but at the same time you don't really control anything because um, you don't know how it works, how things are impacted, so you're always afraid that whatever change you're going to make is going to break everything or you can um, execute a script and then stuff will disappear from your database. So always do a backup. That's, that's the first rule. And you do a backup whenever you do, uh, you roll out a, a new patch, whenever you want to execute some SQL to maybe um, uh, upgrade the schema. Always make a backup before you do anything on the old code. Um, because things, things can, get, can go wrong very quickly. Uh, have a staging environment where you can simulate your deployments. So before you go to the production, uh, so before you, you, you made the change, you tested it locally, but simulate how you will apply that patch to the production environment. And that's what staging is for. It's not just to show people uh, to the client, here you can click, you can test, you can see the changes I made. No, it's also to simulate those, uh, those migrations that you will do, whether you're affecting the uh, database or changing something on the file system. You want to be able to, to play that once and, and make sure that you have not broken anything. And then you just repeat that on the production system. So copy the production system settings to a staging environment and continue from there. Uh, automate tests, of course. So when you, any new code that you write, you should start automating tests. You can also, there are also ways where you can uh, test previously written code um, whenever possible. And then when you refactor, you make sure that whatever changes you made are not actually affecting anything. But of course, you, you probably don't want to go in and start with just unit testing everything. It's, it can be a very long task. And also because the owner of the code uh, doesn't necessarily know how things are even supposed to, to work, whether that is a bug or a normal behavior, um, there's usually no documentation. Nobody. Um, nobody from from when this code was built that is available to answer any questions. Uh, you had a comment? No. Okay. <laughs> All right. And um, so, yeah, the better tests that you do, the more coverage you have. Obviously, the more extensive the changes that you can make. Because if you only tested this area, you can only mess around a little bit. 
the more you test, the, the more the scope of the changes you can make. And make a risk, risk assessment. And it's something that you can discuss with your clients. The risk assessment is basically, well, I know that things can go wrong, but what kind of things can we afford? Sometimes clients can afford to have a minute of downtime. And that's something to discuss because that means that you can, you can maybe be a little more pragmatic and, and worry a bit less. Um, can they afford to lose data? Hopefully not. <laughs> but, you know, talk about these risks and evaluate how many tests you need to write, uh, how many changes can you afford to make um, based on the, the risk of those actions that you will take. It is something to discuss with the client. You might be surprised. It might be that it's not really that critical if something breaks for a while. You might think it is, and you, you'd rather it doesn't, but in case it happens, you know that you won't get sued or anything, or you know the world is not going to explode. So yeah, some clients can stomach more risk and talk to them about that and make a, a fair assessment and see how much, uh, how much these things cost because risk always has a cost associated. If, if the client can pay for that cost, then it makes sense. So calculated risks. Um, so how much to change? Could be all of it. I don't know. It really depends once again. It depends on the state of the current code, whether things can, things are worth salvaging. So think of it as, and I don't mean to speak ill of the, the, the legacy code because it has tremendous value to the clients. It got them where they are. Maybe they're making millions thanks to that code base. But think of it as, you know, a ship that sank and, you know, you can salvage some parts and some you just leave there because they're worthless. Or maybe not in a, in such a bad sense. Maybe it's an old computer. And maybe you can take some parts out and put on your new computer. Some parts are not worth salvaging. I guess that's a more positive metaphor. <laughs> um, yeah, and I personally always start with a framework. And that's really personal because of my experience. I tried sometimes to refactor using just smaller components and tying them together. But as I was continuing with, with the refactoring, I always ended up pulling more and more dependencies. And in the end, I pretty much had a framework just bootstrapped in a different way. So now I just start with a framework. It's Those dependencies don't really cost much usually. So just start with something fresh that is complete so that you can quickly build on top of that, so a solid foundation on, to, on top of which you can build. Even if you're changing small parts, you can move small parts onto the new frameworked version. Um, yeah, and start with small changes, learn the code. Uh, dive deeper as you learn how the code works. So make small changes, go inside. As you are more comfortable with the code, then you can uh, make bigger and bigger changes. And as you are making those changes, when I said, you know, what's worth salvaging and what's worth re rewriting even, maybe some things are not that bad and they don't need to be rewritten right now. So give credit where it's due. So if, if you look at something and like, well, it's not how I would have written it, but it makes sense. So I'll just keep it for now because it makes sense. I can say you have a class and you can interact with it. and It's not perfect, but it does the job. And maybe sm small changes, maybe you don't need to make any changes. Maybe it works the way it does and you can change everything around it. So be, be very tolerant and... Uh, remember that it was written 15 years ago, right? So the, the practices were not the same. We didn't have the same practices we have now. Um, some programming languages didn't have a, uh, a test automation tool. Um, then, you know, some things like uh, ASP Classic, it's like PHP 3, it's very, very top down, you know, very procedural. So, so yeah, basically, well, when you're rewriting, eventually you know that if you want to end up with a complete rewrite at some stage because you want everything to be clean, you know, a clean architecture, at some point you can say, well, I'll keep it for now. It's like, it's like saying, you, I like you, I'll kill you last, you know? It's basically the, well, not necessarily this in, in, a, in a bad tone, but yeah, if, if you are going to rewrite it, you will. But if it makes sense, you can keep it for later. You just prioritize. 
And how do you prioritize? You start with the components that are the most at risk, and there are mathematical models to calculate the risk. Uh, it's called cyclomatic complexity. And, and then you take the ones that are highest risk, and you start refactoring those. Or maybe you want to refactor where the client is in most dire need. So for example, if the system has a lot of components to it, and the billing component is broken, and the client cannot bill the customers properly because that component doesn't do correct calculations, maybe you want to start with that so at least the customer gets uh, the money flowing. So you can prioritize differently. So when you are uh, refactoring, don't be zealous. Once again, give credit where it's due. This is, this is not too bad. You know, you're not going to worry too much about whether it's indented with tabs or spaces. I mean, you can, you can give it a little bit of, uh, you know, give it a break, basically. And yeah, I mean, we like cr a clean code, and, but I still prefer to have a, a small footprint when I start changing the code. Depends on the, on the strategy and if it's a fresh database or if I have to deal with the old database schema. Uh, but I try to always think about the change and how it contributes towards the objectives. So every project starts with objectives. What are we trying to achieve? Are we trying to increase the number of sales, reduce the number of errors in the billing? So once you have those objectives, um, you, uh, Whenever you make any change, think, is it actually contributing to that objective? Reducing the technical debt will probably be one of your objectives. That's, that's the point. Uh, but remember the objective and always make changes that are contributing the most towards that objective. Um, and yeah, for database schema, you'll need uh, migration scripts. And uh, yes, because you are going to need those migration scripts, that is why I like to have the smallest footprint possible so that I don't constantly change the schema because, you know, things you can, you can re uh, downgrade, like you can upgrade the database and downgrade, but if you have deleted a column, for example, you cannot undelete it, so uh, there are limitations to that. So here are some of my stories of things that I had to do for my clients. And one of them was... So Magento is written in PHP. It's a e-commerce platform, uh, the most popular e-commerce platform. And uh, between the minor versions, they, are, they were actually very big changes uh, that are not backwards compatible. And so, or rather, it is not that they're not backwards compatible, but rather that it is very hard to upgrade the database if something something uh, is wrong because they have scripts that can automate this for you, which seems like, okay, I just pressed the button. Usually how Magento works is, you know, when you install plugins or you upgrade, you just dump the new code in, in your uh, directory, and of course in production, which is a bit weird, but you dump the new code there, and the next time you run any page, it will see that there's a mismatch between the version of the code that you just put in the, in the file system, because they have like uh, XML that says, this is the version of the data. And so it checks against the database. So here the data is supposed to be 1.6. Uh, my database is 1.5. So I'm going to execute this and this and this script. So it executes a bunch of SQL and, and all that, it, but not within the transaction. So if something fails, you are stuck with like a half process and you're not sure which plugins have been migrated. So it, it can be quite difficult. It's supposed to be flawless, but in this case it wasn't because somebody apparently went and made some manual changes to the schema, which made these scripts fail. And I don't know which change because some developer sometimes was hired and did something and nobody knows really. Something happened to the production database, something got screwed up and nobody knows. And there's no way for me to tell. So the simplest way I found um, is to, uh, to simulate the upgrade on a clean install and then replicate the changes. And by the way, if I had a euro for every time I misspelled Magento as Magneto, it wouldn't have been so painful to upgrade. <laughs> yes, I'm, whenever I Google stuff, um, I misspell Magento as Magneto. <laughs> That's me. So the solution was uh, to make a fresh 1.9 install. 
So I did one fresh 1.5 install and then 1.9. I applied all the same plugins that were installed because it's a system that's modular. You can download third-party plugins, put them in a directory, and all of it's supposed to work. So I just did a, a fresh install for both, and that generated me a database schema. And now I took, took those two schemas and used a uh, Python script called schema sync that compares the two schemas and generates the SQL necessary to go from one and the other. And the thing is, if you reverse the source and destination, it creates a downgrades uh, patch, basically, which is pretty cool. And then you take all the content of the database because it, uh, Magento stores extra attributes about entities in a database. So there's records, I think it's a table called uh, EV attributes, and then basically a product can have extra attributes that the plugin decided to have, and you can use those attributes. Um, you, you don't actually change the database schema, you create a record in table so that whenever it tries to fetch attributes, it goes, also checks that table, what it contains, and then loads from another table by that ID the value of the attribute for that product. So um, makes things a bit more difficult, but once again, you can just take that the content of that uh, table and do a, a diff on the content, and you know which ones you will need to port to the new system. So. What I was left with after, with a few minor tweaks, what I was left with after is a nice SQL script that would upgrade the database flawlessly because it was designed specifically for that state of the database, right? Even though somebody made some changes that I was unaware of, the script, the, the, the diff fixed that. So I could just take that SQL, go to the production database, and once I had the files installed, instead of running the upgrade scripts, I would run my SQL patch, and that solved the problem. So sometimes you have to be clever, you know, you have to be creative and think outside the box, not just worry about how do I run those um, upgrade scripts properly. What is it that those scripts are doing, and then maybe replicate it in a different manner. Um, and they were doing hundreds of queries, so you wouldn't have done it manually, but there's a tool that allowed me to do that, which is pretty nice. Another story is, yes. So it was actually a mix of PHP 3 and PHP 5.2, but, uh, sorry, PHP 5.3, but it wasn't maybe written for 5.3. Um, I don't know, the code doesn't say what version it was written for, but the server was running on 5.3, but some of the code was obviously written in the PHP 3 era, just by the way it was written, I could tell because that's how people coded at the time. When you mash all of your uh, HTML and, and PHP and SQL in one page, that's probably in no reference to any objects. Well, that's because PHP 3 didn't have object-oriented. So that's how I deduced that this is PHP 3. And somebody tried to do a rewrite with um, some objects in PHP 3 and didn't complete the rewrite and actually made things worse. <laughs> So we were, well, worse in the sense that now you have two ways of doing things with a lot of spaghetti, and the rewrite wasn't actually using OP concepts. So yes, they, there are objects, but they're not quite oriented anywhere. Um, it's like a, a, jo a joke I had at a company once. Um, a colleague of mine made it. We said, oh, it is object-oriented. It's an object. Now you have to just orient it. <laughs> So it basically, it means that you have a class that doesn't have any properties, and it just have a bunch of static methods, and that is the same as loading the functions at PHP file, because static methods without any properties, they're not really objects, they're just namespaces for your functions. That's all they are. And there was a lot of that, so you would pass always all the arguments to every function, instead of instantiating, you know, like having constructors and destructors, and doing things properly, um, so it was a, a you know, just includes over all, all over the place and um, uh, those ifs that concatenated SQL. So you start with a beginning of an SQL that gets those columns from, well, not necessarily columns, not necessarily in the right order. So like bits of SQL here and there. So just strings concatenated together in some some voodoo way, 
and uh, not quite sure what was happening there, you know, and things that it's fi uh, f the, one of the files that this file includes starts the SQL concatenation or it defines a string that is later concatenated here. So to trace that, I literally had to take a paper and write the file names and say, oh, here's this bit is here. So I had to like put it together like a puzzle just to understand how is the SQL created and why is it misbehaving? Why is it not generating the SQL that I need? So yeah, previous uh, rewrite attempt was uh, was a failure and ended up with folders of dead code because not only did the person attempt a rewrite, a full rewrite, that's what the person tried to do. And then it didn't quite work, so he just took the folder, I say he because I know now who he is, uh, <laughs> So he took the, the, the folder, and what's interesting is that I made assumptions about the person's, the, the, the guy's personality, which were confirmed when I, when I met him. So the codes betrays the, per, the personality, the behavior. It's, it's really interesting. You can analyze a person's brain by looking at their code. It's just side information. So he took this, this folder with all of that structure, copied it next to it, and started doing a different, slightly different approach, and then left out all that dead code, and then things started pointing to one folder or the other, and there's dead code, entire folders of them, but you know, don't know which ones. Sometimes it points to V1, sometimes it's V2. And so it was all over the place. It was even harder to trace than the original. Right, so the solution to that, enough bashing on the other developer's code, <laughs> Uh, the solution to that was to uh, rewrite some of the more complex forms in Symfony, which is a well-known framework. Um, so the complex forms, one of the forms that uh, was supposed to, basically it's a multi-step form, it's a sign-up process, and so it stores things in the session, and the way it was doing storing things would, for example, you would validate the data on step one, store the, that portion, validate step two, store that portion, but if you go back to step one, it wouldn't validate again because it checks at which stage we were. So, oh, we were at stage two, so we don't need to validate stage one again. So you could change things, like uncheck the terms in, uh, of service, like disagree to the terms of, of service, and it will still pass. Then you can complete everything without agreeing to the terms, which was really weird. So I rewrote all of that in Symfony with proper session management. Um, so the, the idea is I rewrote also one of the biggest module that, uh, that the code base had, which was the billing module. Uh, it was rewritten using proper OOP concepts. And in order to rewrite that, I used a concept called design extraction, which I will mention in a second. Um, uh, so I, I extracted the design, and then I automated the test for that, and then I wrote the code. And uh, what I did is that for the pages that were concerned by those changes, I just put a mod rewrite to basically route it to a different location. So I say, well, for, for the sign up, you know, step one, step two, for the sign up, just go to that script instead of the actual file because it was, right, it was like slash something dot PHP. So it was pointing to physical files. And instead I used mod rewrite to take that file name and instead route it to a, a to a routing component in Symfony, which would do the rest properly. So design is, is extraction is an interesting concept. The idea is to avoid code bias, because when you are looking at code that you are rewriting, uh, what you are going to write next is going to be influenced by whatever decisions were made in the original code. So in order to avoid that and to truly create a better architecture and truly clean code, what you want is take the old code and create documentation for that. And when I say documentation, it's like uh, uh, ERDs and flowcharts and um, decision trees. And you can share that with the client because clients, they understand that. If you, if you do it in a simple way and you explain to them and the person was totally not a technical person, and so I sent him the design documents and we validated. Decision trees are the simplest ones probably to, to talk about. Um, so we talk about the decision tree, how the billing works, you know, it makes a decision here and there. 
um, about you know based on okay so if it's if the call uh, the call originated from this country then add these charges and things like that so I validated the the the, the documents so clarify some of the business rules as well because I wouldn't have gotten those business rules just by reading the code they weren't correctly implemented so I would have made that mistake so in re-implementing I would have transported all the bugs basically with me so by clarifying now I have I can I refine the document the the, the decision improve the design then I call the customer again to validate the changes and you know did I understand the, all the business rules correctly yes okay let's move forward and from that design we can then create entirely new code. So you don't look at the other code, you just look at the design documents and you write from scratch. And that's what I did. But just for one module, not the whole system, because it was huge. It was written over, I don't know how many years, but it was just a huge code base. So and by improving the design, you're making uh, your, your system more flexible because then you know what kind of, of changes uh, the customer might request. So you plan ahead for that. You make it more flexible, more pluggable, and you reduce the technical depth dramatically by doing that. Um, and you know, when you call your customer, of course, with their permission, you can record the call because it's illegal to record a call without permission. Just ask, is it okay if I record that? And um, you can then refer to that conversation later. And it shouldn't be a conversation that takes more than one hour. So yeah, and then we, we rewrote that component and now it runs very well. So some more stories. I talked about ASP Classic, which is pretty much equivalent to PHP 3, just in the way files are structured, in the way people wrote code. It's very similar and we wanted to move it to PHP 5.6. So it was 15 years plus, I, um, I just made assumption based on the technology used, but it could have been older than that. So ASP Classic is no longer supported and has really a lot, a lot of lines of code. I said the previous one had a lot. This one like had gazillions of lines of code. I don't even know the exact number, but it was huge. So the solution was, um, and I'll show you a diagram of, of this architecture that I proposed, is to, once again, use Symfony, my favorite framework, use Symfony to rewrite page by page because the way ASP Classic works is basically just one page. Maybe includes a few files, but you enter on a file path and then you enter in that file and all the HTML is there, you know, the title, the, the head, the title, everything. Everything is self-contained, which is actually easier, a bit easier to rewrite than something that is written with objects because it's, it's just so atomic. And so what we did is we used mode rewrite for the concern pages once again to, um, um, whenever you would try to access an ESP file, instead it would go to the framework and will fetch something entirely different. And you, you think it's ASP, but it's not. <laughs> so it's, it's PHP 5.6 now, which is now forward compatible with PHP 7, which is coming out very soon. So um, then there was a DB session adapter in both apps because, well, in PHP it was simple. In, um, in ASP Classic, it would store a session in some obscure area of IIS in a format that, well, first of all, it wasn't accessible through PHP and in the format that PHP couldn't read. So instead, we created an adapter. Luckily, there was a, a file that was being included everywhere that would access that session. So we could rewrite that, that function to uh, store it in the database instead. So instead of storing the session somewhere, we store it in the database and now PHP can easily access that session. Now you have a shared session between um, the two applications and the session is for user login. So whenever somebody logs in, they have a session and now they have uh, context, you know, their customer ID and things like that. Um, and the thing is the page in any language is just an HTTP request. Which, which is what worked to our advantage. We were able to automate tests with Guzzle by sending HTTP requests and comparing the output. And here's how we, uh, how we set this up. So here's the test, the Guzzle test. We start with the test, we prepare an HTTP request. 
So, you know, either upload files or some post or just get, you know, the URL, the verb. Uh, all of the verbs were get, though, for, for the ASP application. There were no other verbs used. Um, so we are, um, we created that HTTP request and sent it first to the ASP version of the, of the page. So we, we tried to, to test that page and we got the, the response and we cleaned up a bit because some of the HTML, you know, was formatted in a weird way. So just the parts we were concerned, we extracted, um, and we stored that. And then we took the same request and sent it to the other version that was now rewritten. So we would rewrite literally page by page. So you can take one page, you can rewrite it in Symfony, reroute to it, and now you write the test to send the same request to that page and then compare the responses and if they are the same and you know of course you check other states such as if it writes to the database you check the state of the database things like that uh, possibly encapsulated in, in a transaction so that you can roll back without having to re, uh, redo the whole database uh, every time and then you compare the responses and if they are the same then you have succeeded in rewriting it properly but of course, you are rewriting it in a clean fashion, you know, proper MVC and, and you know, separation of concerns and all the good patterns. And so we, would, we were able to do that literally page by page, and it worked really well because now they could stop supporting those other uh, version of the code, just delete the old ASP code and no longer have to support it because otherwise, um, you know, they were thinking about other approaches and it would have been not that nice because um, you wouldn't be able to, uh, um, you would still have to support two applications at the same time. They really wanted that whenever they rewrite a page, they want to stop worry about the ASP part of that. And it worked very well. Another application, and this is my last story because I have lots and lots of stories. This, these are just stories from the last year and a half. And by no means complete because my, my projects, my contracts are very short, sometimes just a few days, sometimes maybe maybe a month, you know. So they're relatively short. Um, so I go through a whole bunch of projects and more than half of them are legacy. So PHP 3 to PHP 5, 6. Um, it was uh, about 12 years old, the code. Um, you know, lots of spaghetti, lots of hacks as usual. Uh, that was how we rolled back uh, 12 years ago. So it uses, used a lot of deprecated functions which made the code not compatible with the newer version of PHP 5.6. And we really wanted to leverage some of the newer features like uh, traits and closures and just simple short array syntax which is a bit nicer. Uh, if you ever seen how to write arrays in PHP, uh, in the old syntax of PHP, it's very verbose for no reason. Uh, now it's really just square brackets and like almost JSON-like. So this, so this wouldn't run on PHP 5.6 and uh, the version PHP 5.3 is being discontinued this month. So it was essential to, uh, uh, to make sure that any new code that's written will be written um, that is, you know, on PHP 5.6 and later easily upgradable to uh, PHP 7. So we already know what's coming up in PHP 7, so we can plan ahead and not use the features that they said would be deprecated. All right, so the, the solution for that was actually quite interesting. Uh, we split the servers into 5.3 and 5.6 for, for a completely fresh start, and the, the newer version would be implemented as a REST API, okay? I'll show you a diagram in a moment. It's a REST API, and then on the same server where we had the old application, we put just a little portion of an AngularJS that will then call the, the new API. And AngularJS doesn't need PHP to run, so it doesn't matter which version it's on. It's purely front-end. So we, we separate it like this, and then it would call the API that is running on the newer version. And the API, of course, is a, a very good approach, and it would enable them to create better interfaces, better you know, user experience, better workflows. Um, and at the same time, it's, it, I find it personally much easier to deal with APIs than to work with um, more complex PHP applications. And uh, 
Yeah, and it would run on a new, an entirely new server with PHP 5.6, and, and the, it would be seamless. So the only thing we just needed to do is forward the authorization headers that would come in uh, to the uh, Angular application. So whenever you are, since you are still on the same domain name, the um, authorization headers will come in, and you can just wrap the API calls with those authorization headers, forward them, and the um, the other application would. Um, uh, authorize as well. So here's here's the setup. So the first server is you know site.server.com, uh, one URL, and then you have a request coming in. This is the old application running on 5.3, and then using um, so in Apache you have uh, um, a directive called alias, which is really nice. Try it, and basically the whole uh, sub pattern. So for example, slash module name, whatever follows. Module name uh, will be uh, will be using a completely different folder, which would house the Angular JS application. And from there, you know, send the authorization headers uh, to the API. The API will validate the user still with that old database because that's where the users are. Would validate, and but any other requests could make you could add it to this old database, the new tables. But you can also start with a new database makes no difference. Now, now you have this flexibility. So it's a pretty pretty simple thing, um, not, not too many components, nothing very fancy, and it enables to move forward, and now the company won't have any problems with a PHP version. So they'll write the new modules on this new API and eventually migrate the other modules to that API as well to get rid of PHP 5.3 as fast as possible. And when you do that, it's just small parentheses, uh, don't forget to uh, implement course correctly on the API side. Uh, so course is um, cross-origin resource sharing, so that whenever you do AJAX calls, the browsers first do an options call. So just read up on that. The cool thing with Symfony is that it just install a bundle. It works, so it's really nice. Uh, but if you're not sure how to do this with your application, just read up on that. It's just about sending the proper headers. So basically it checks with options, the options verb, it's not a post, it's not a get, it checks with options, and it says, well, which headers do you accept, which verbs do you accept, and then uh, if, if, those, uh, if the ones that it's trying to send next are not available, then it will just not perform that operation. Okay, so just a, a little extra layer of, of uh, security. Uh, right, so this is how alias was set up. Alias, this is in, um, the contrast is a bit bad on this um, projector, but uh, so the alias was set up, you know, with a slash module name and points to a different um, area in the um, a different folder on the file system. And then you just define the directory with the rewrite base and whatever other um, directives you need there. Uh, the slides will be online, so you don't have to worry. So, um, yeah, I I hope I'll make it on time. Yeah, I'll try to go quickly on the next segment. So how to not get stuck, basically start small, make a roadmap. Uh, don't skip the design stage, it's very important. Make a good plan. If you are stuck, bounce ideas, preferably with new people that are not um, the same people with who you regularly talk about uh, technology because you, everybody tends to get tunnel vision. You know, this is the problem. You don't see everything outside. So to be more creative, it helps to talk with other people who are not involved in the project so that they can have a fresh perspective. Um, you know, and also ask yourself, has this been done before? Can I look at some other code, some examples? So this is why I share the stories. Well, this and this has been done before, so you have some, some ideas on how to tackle those problems. Uh, try another approach, you know, maybe, maybe you're stuck because you're going in a direction and you're trying, I don't know, to run two PHP versions on the same server. Well, it may be possible, but maybe there's another way simply to do that. So bro uh, open your eyes to whatever's around and, and see, see if there's another solution. So talk to people to get those ideas. And sometimes it's okay to also walk away. Sometimes you don't need the change that you're trying to make. You are so focused on solving this problem that suddenly you realize, well, maybe I can solve it in an entirely different way so this obstacle will just disappear. It will no longer be there because I'll be going in another direction. So, oh, there's a mountain here. I'll just go through here instead. So that's the basic idea. Um, ask refactoring aspects. There are people who are specializing in that. I am one, shameless promotion. 
so pick their brain, um, you know, read their blog. Uh, you can hire them for one day. Uh, so, for example, uh, things that they can do is uh, help with the refactoring strategy. So come up with these diagrams, these ideas, uh, remove some roadblocks. Uh, guidance is something that you can get from, from consultants. Uh, you can hire them like for one day per week that they would come in or maybe chat on the phone and be able to find solutions to common obstacles so that the team isn't, you know, if they're stuck, they're only stuck until the next uh, checkup. And then at that point, the, the obstacles might be removed and then they can move forward and not get perpetually stuck in the, in the problem. Um, practice creative thinking. Once again, I talked about tunnel vision and opening uh, um, to the possibilities. You know, there's a lot of literature on creative thinking. It's something that you can you can become more creative. You're not just born creative, like some people say. You can become more creative by practicing. And I myself uh, went through that change about two, three years ago. I decided to be more creative. So I read on that. I watched some videos and I tried things, and I became a lot more creative than I used to be which is pretty cool. Um, one of the things I learned is to step away from the monitor and have a different area where I can think because the monitor is where I have to produce and producing means that you have to focus and that means narrowing your vision. Um, instead, you know, I have whiteboard area, I have a beanbag area, I, you know, something often actually almost every day I go for lunch outside and, and chat about the problems, and that's, um, that really helps. And sometimes you can chat with non-developers, or just look at how other people in other industries have solved a similar problem. Maybe a gardener has solved a problem that is conceptually the same as yours. So, you know, read on different things, not just development. There are answers out there that are just amazing, and when you realize that uh, something that's, you know, some solution that a grocery store found. You're like, wow, this can actually apply to my code. It's, it's amazing what you can find. Uh, so some of the takeaways, yeah, get inspiration from others. Refactoring is hard at first, but it gets easier with time, with practice. Um, yeah, use some known tools and methodologies. There, there are already solutions out there that you can apply. And uh, practice creative thinking. And remember that. Now, every problem has a solution, and probably more than one solution, and you can just pick them. Don't, don't be afraid. Don't, don't worry that, oh my God, there's no solution to this. I'm never going to get through. It's maybe because you're not looking in the right place. So um, there's always a solution. So that's me. I'm Anna. I do development in PHP JavaScript. I fix problems with you know, like bugs and performance issues, um, you know, work, um, provide workshops on testing and Angular and APIs. And I help with testing strategy and with legacy code. And I'll tweet those slides. And we still have two minutes for questions. Yes. Okay, so how do I tackle things where the database itself is legacy and, for example, you have, um, you don't have primary keys um, on the table, so how do I deal with that? I actually had a similar problem recently where a database would use, instead of uh, primary keys, it would use composite keys for, like, foreign keys. For example, there's a customer and there's the, um, some other object related to the customer, so now you have, um, like, a, a new Non, not quite unique identifier, only unique within the scope of the customer. So that's like a composite key. And then the object related to that has also so a, 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 a composite foreign key. And then the primary key is a composite with yet another. So now you have a three key composite and a four key composite as you go down. 
So it was quite a mess, and it's not something that was supported by the ORM we were using. So what we did is we created um, uh, proper uh, IDs on those tables, and we knew that you know we were we will move forward with that. So you can generate obviously IDs for things that were there in the past. Um, you can write scripts if you need to link things together, and uh, yeah, you can make those changes to the database. Is that satisfactory? Maybe we can talk about specifics after this. <laughs> All right. Yes. Okay, so did we upgrade databases? Yeah, databases are very tricky to upgrade. So if there's a, a newer version of the database, sometimes the queries designed for those databases will not, might not be compatible. It's an issue. I haven't had too many problems with databases, though, because we could, I guess, live with the versions that were there because databases are more limited in features, I guess, than uh, programming languages. So programming languages is something you would upgrade. Databases not necessarily keep up all the time, but yeah, they do also get discontinued versions. Um, it can be a challenge, but uh, yeah, the, the hardest part is really, I would say, not the uh, schema itself, but rather uh, the, the SQL queries that are written for that version. Um, and that might be sometimes a manual process. You can, you can just grab some things, you know, just do a, a, a search replace. Um, and sometimes you might have to go in manually, but yeah, that can be quite some effort. But sometimes that effort might be, uh, might be a, a good investment when you think about it. So maybe you take a week to change all those SQL queries, but now you upgrade to a new database, which is maybe more feature re rich. You can have like uh, built-in JSON support and things like that. It can be very useful. It's not you kind of mix like relational with no SQL. Any other questions? All right, thank you. <laughs>